Hi, I'm Oliver. Welcome to my talk about DevOps automation with Go. So I've been a software engineer for more than 20 years and I discovered Go back in 2017 and I immediately fell in love with it. It's a great language to write, but especially to read when you have a large code base to get into. I've been the lead developer at RestorePoint since 2019. RestorePoint is the name of our company, but also of our main product which is a network automation device backup and restore solution. It's all written as a Go monolith. So we have a single binary, which is highly concurrent. We have our own scheduler, HTTP server, FTP server, TFTP server, a Lua environment, etc., etc. And all this runs within, inside a Linux environment, which we tightly control. So most of our customers run it on-premise or in their own cloud. And it's updated either manual or automatic by an update server. So we currently have around 120,000 lines of Go, not counting comments, uh, plus roughly 2.8 million from external libraries. And we use GitLab for our whole development lifecycle. So how does our DevOps look like? So we have three different release versions. We have two target environments. We do weekly production releases. We could actually release every day if we wanted to, but uh, most of our customers prefer a weekly release. So we release in the middle of the week, but we do our development releases internally. They are released whenever there's a change. So that's continuous. And we have multiple internal tools that make our lives easier. And as you can see down here in that image, that is how our pipeline looks at the moment. So one of our internal tools is the uh, release API which avoids us having to copy the build artifacts from our build server to the update server. So it's a tightly controlled um, solution and it's used by multiple of our products and it's a single binary service as well. And so it has two sides. So the build server sends a call to like a via post, of course, and it sends these, the final build artifacts as a TGZ it MD5 sums the TGZ and then sends additional metadata. So down here, I've uh, copied the, the call that we actually sent to our server. As you can see, there's a lot of additional metadata. Doesn't apply for all uh, products, for, for most of them. And then there's a shared secret between the build server and the release API. So that the release API will only react to calls that contain that shared secret. And then on the receiving side, so the the release API re receives that post request that I mentioned, checks that all required metadata fields for a product have been passed, checks the shared secret, of course, and then it writes the, the file that's been passed and calculates the MD5 sum at the same time, which is uh, it's a quite a nice um, trick you can do in Go by using a T reader. And if the calculated MD5 sum is not the same as the one that has been sent in the request, then the uh, release is also um, aborted. And once all the checks are done, then the, the metadata is written to an end file as well as the TGZ, and then it's passed to a individual release script based on the product. And this is a, a single binary uh, service, as I mentioned, and it's also, um, yeah, it's maybe a hundred lines of code and it's a really nice, like it's, it's one of the powers of Go, in my opinion, that you can actually write a web server and a very few lines. Uh, another tool that we have is the Freshdesk GitLab bridge. So for our first line support, we use Freshdesks. And as developers, we only deal with issues in GitLab and our support engineers decide when to escalate issues to us as developers. And we've written a temper monkey script around that, which injects a button into the Freshdesk UI. So it's quite easy to um, trigger that escalation process. And it will copy all comments from Freshdesk and all attachments into an issue in GitLab. And it avoids creating duplicates as well. And also makes sure that both sides have a link. So you know which ones are have been escalated and which ones are not. I can show that real quick. Um, so this is a video that I took. So as you can see that button over here, this is the injected button and it will ask you if you really want to do this. And then it will copy the files from a fresh desk and will create a GitLab issue out of the fresh desk issue. And that's uh, quite a neat way for us to deal with 
customer so support without having to expose the whole team to to all custom issues not all of them are related to development and also this is a single uh, binary service as well and then we have a, another tool which we call the automatic version check it warns us because we have more than one production release we have three actually it warns us if we are trying to merge mismatched versions so if i want to say um, as you can see here in the screenshots we have a 531 version and a 54 version when trying to merge that then it will get i get this warning as a comment and the way it works with merge requests internally you cannot merge a merge request unless you have resolved all issues like all discussions on a merge request so this will keep the merge request from being auto or accidentally merged this works by a webhook so this is also a service that's running on a server and gitlab basically sends all merge requests or like signals all merge requests via webhook to this uh, endpoint and then we use the gitlab api to check the version of the source and target branch and then uh, we have an additional thing um, for automating our development workflow so we use uh, gitlab has these things called um, boards and you can use different statuses which are labels in uh, gitlab and these labels they are for i mean we use them for everything for um, the area of the product it uh, applies to if it's a ui or an api issue if it's a fresh test ticket for example but also for process so our gitlab issues always go through that uh, stage from open to to do to in development to in review to test to testing and then eventually they get closed and we just make sure that we automatically uh, transition issues when a merge request is opened so the only thing a developer has to do is to actually mention the number of a an gitlab issue in their merge request and then the ticket will automatically be set to be in review and when the merge request is merged then it's changed to test and this really reduces the amount of manual updates that we have to do because as developers we tend to always forget these things and but it's nice to have our issues in the right state so it's clear where we are what the progress is etc and then uh, another thing that because we have a highly concurrent piece of software with a lot of lines of code so we from time to time have data races and go has this nice way of allowing you to detect race conditions so it will see if a variable is read and written to at the same time and therefore all of our internal development builds have race condition detection enabled which is a bit of a performance or oh, it has an, a performance impact uh, so it i think it increases cpu usage by i can't remember but it's it, it definitely takes more cpu cycles but especially memory i think it doubles the memory usage so we only do this for um, development builds internally. And the reason why we have to do this is because most of our uh, race conditions, they happen whenever a certain code pass is hit. And uh, we have, of course, fixed all the low hanging fruit, but there's always something uh, left somewhere. And also sometimes it's library code. So we have discovered quite a lot of race conditions in, in external libraries and then reported that as well. And so we have a lot of internal boxes that replicate all the common usage scenarios that we have and they run 24 7 and then they write a race condition error messages into their log files and then we run a um, this race condition check tool once every day on these individual machines and then they automatically uh, if a race condition is found in logs then it will automatically create a gitlab issue for each entry and if uh, an entry already exists then it will uh, add a comment instead to keep the issue fresh so i copied here an example of how that looks like in a, in a log so it starts with warning uh, colon data race that's the start uh, marker and then it usually goes like right at blah blah me uh, memory address and go routine number number something and then the the code the the function where this occurs this is what we use as the title and then everything below so between the start and the end marker we put into the issue and this ends up looking like this so i had to blur of course the details uh, for obvious reasons but it will basically uh, show this it shows uh, where it occurred where the write was where the where the previous write was where a read was and uh, 
it will automatically label it with the race conditions tag, which is uh, important. So we can actually see if that this was an actual race condition problem. Yeah. And so, and that's a yeah, really ni nice solution for that. And then we have another uh, tool, which is um, for automatic library versioning. So we have roughly um, 20 internal libraries that are being used by different uh, products. And these are consumed via Go modules, of course, and Go likes semantic version tags. So when you do a Go get, and then you say the name of the library or the, the URL of the library, and then add, and then the version tag. And we built a tool around that, which is a job that's run on the individual libraries at CI CD pipeline. It's a tag job. And it will basically, whenever the master branch of um, the library is updated, it will tag the library automatically using the last commit message as the tag or like description of the tag and increases the patch level of uh, the previous tag and therefore create a new version, which then can be used in um, the product that is using the library. And it will make sure that it will either uh, increment the any existing tags or if no tags exist then it will just create a new one yeah and this is it so this is how we automate our own um, devops at restore point uh, and i have to do a shameless plug at the end of course so we are hiring in uh, either remote uk or eu and our pitch is of course the if you're tired of the same old go microservices on kubernetes pitch then maybe have a chat with us uh, as I explained, we ship an on-premise Go monolith uh, wrapped in a Linux box every week, and our customers love it. And yeah, we're looking for driven and analytical software engineers, ideally with Go experience, but we can also uh, consider you if you are uh, really experienced in, a, in another language and you want to cross-train because Go is relatively easy to pick up. Yeah, so please come and talk to either me or hit our careers page. Thank you very much.